from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see over 100 scriptures with detailed information of what many call the end times, the last days. Now we are currently in a time frame where many biblical prophecies are being fulfilled. We are also now on the verge of entering a new eon, a new age. Christians call it the Kingdom Age, and the Jews say it's a messianic end time. On the first day of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, a 15-year-old Jewish boy named Matan died, and it was a clinical death. After his death, he had an out-of-body experience where his soul left his body, and he was shown and taken and seen many things in heaven and hell. In this experience, he saw many people studying Torah and what he called the lower paradise. He was told by angels to do mitzvahs, which are God's commandments from the Torah. He was told new explanations of Torah, to study Torah. He stated the redemption is very close and that the war of Gog and Magog has already started, as well as many other end of days information. Now what I'd like to point out is Natan is not from Jerusalem. He comes from a secular background and has never studied in yeshiva. And for those who don't know, yeshiva is a Jewish institution that focuses on the study of traditional religious texts, primarily the Talmud and Torah. Natan's testimony is a powerful confirmation of what Forerunner Ministries International head pastor Michael Petro has been teaching for many years. In this video, we will take a look at a few clips of Pastor Michael's prophecies and teachings that parallel what Natan experienced as well as an interview with Pastor Michael to further discuss prophecies and scripture. Now here's a quick look at some of Natan's story. He is only 15 years old. When the soul leaves the body, it can receive huge amounts of information in just minutes. That means that what takes years for a person here in this world to learn, there in that world, one can know and understand alone within a matter of minutes, everything. He felt like he left his body, exited through his nose, and at first he floated above himself, and at first he didn't understand who he was, where his self was. Yes, gentlemen, that is what I said at the beginning. It's hard to understand, but what we can acquire in years of learning, there you can understand everything in one minute. Take note of what he is saying. He says, I understand alone, see alone. He isn't the first one who was there and came back. I personally know many, many more like him. They all relate the same thing, a huge amount of information in a second. That means that a person can be in one place and know where his father is, where his mother is, what is happening with them. I knew everything. And simply, it's simply the world of truth. In the world of truth, everything is revealed. There is nothing hidden. The soul can receive. Now those two people simply took me. The angels of destruction took me. And they took me to a place, a scale, with huge weighing pans. My transgressions and my mitzvot, every single thing like I told you before, the smallest mitzvot overturned entire world. You get a huge reward when you make a blessing. It's something gigantic, gigantic, something really huge. And also a transgression. The smallest thing is also something really, really, really big. He said to me, do a lot of mitzvot. Why? In the end you pay. Even if you don't do anything, you will pay in the end. He told me that what I had seen there was nothing, and he spoke to me in a really frightening voice. I'm here with Michael Petro. He's the pastor and founder of Forerunner Ministries International. He's also an apostle and a prophet and an author, as well as a doctor. And he teaches from the Hebraic mindsets, and he goes through the scripture and really unpacks them in the parabolic meaning, um, as well as going through temple theology and really upholding Torah and mitzvah, like we just saw that Natan experienced when he was in heaven. So now that we've seen these clips about Natan, and he's talking about how in heaven the mitzvahs are so huge, it's such a huge blessing, it overturns um, entire worlds, even the angel of death is telling him to do mitzvahs. And then we see in scripture that, you know, um, in Deuteronomy, there's blessing and curses if you obey or disobey the commandments. And then we see also Yeshua talking about the commandments, that if you love me, you will keep the commandments. So this is why I love being a part of your ministry, because you do uphold the commandments. But if you can share and expand on, on why you teach them, why you teach them prophetically, and just share more about that. The mitzvahs, when Moses received the Torah from God, at Mount Sinai, the Lord wasn't teaching him 613 rules of do's and don'ts. It's very simple. Moses was being uh, inquisitive when he asked the Lord. He said, Lord, show me your ways. Show me your character. Show me who you are. So what happened 
was God downloaded Moses, not only just with Torah, which we know that the Torah is the Ten Commandments of God, but those Ten Commandments break down into 613 commandments. And commandment really is not the proper word in the Hebrew. Uh, the word should literally be interpreted the way of life. So when we talk about the mitzvahs, we're talking about a way of life, a way of living, a way uh, that God uh, is asking us to live with each other, how we treat one another and how we treat him. So in the, mitzv in the mitzvahs, they are uh, not rules of do's and don'ts, but they are really prophetic utterances that when you begin to see what they're really saying, it always pertains to nature. It always pertains to the character of an individual and their character with God. So the mitzvah is very important to understand. One, Jesus taught them. And two, when we take a look at the scripture, it's, it's clear that when Jesus was talking about loving your uh, brother and your neighbor as you love yourself and loving God, you know, with all your heart, all your soul, your might. And he said, all the rest of the commandments hang upon these two. He didn't say they were done away with. He said, all the rest hang on them. If you understand the Torah, the two scrolls, one half of it, five commandments is how we treat each other. And the other half is our relationship with God. And so the mitzvahs are the 613 commandments that come after it. It's interesting though, if you turn them upside down, you get a tree and we get the tree of life. So the mitzvah really is God's tree of life. It was the nature, the character, the, the literal manifestation of his very being, and he was letting us know who he is. The problem is within the body of Christ today is that you know a lot of them have thrown out the commandments. I guess it's just easier to get people to sit in the pews if they don't have to do anything or don't have to serve God. So bottom line is if we're going to have to be like the early church, which, by the way, the early church did command that the believers, that they had to follow the, the Torah and they had to follow the mitzvahs. We've gotten away from uh, really, really the early church doctrine, the early church theology. Since the law was merely a rude outline foreshadowing the good things to come instead of the full expression of those things, it can never, by offering the same sacrifice continually year after year, make perfect those who approach the altar. So the Torah is a shadow of things to come. Here's your Torah. That's the Ten Commandments broken down into 613 rules. All these are in the scripture. All these are in the Bible. So what the rabbis did is they went into each and every one of these verses and they aligned it to the commandments of God. And the Lord said, only if you love, oh, he said, if you love me, you will obey me. He said, so and Jesus said, why do you say that you love me and you know, don't obey my commandments? So we, we can talk about love all day long, but there's no obedience to the word that there's no love. He makes us all act. Hallelujah. So how long have we been lying? The whole time we've been in religion. Right. Amen. So as we as we go through these, it's not just about looking at these and face value. You know, you're only allowed to do this and you're only allowed to do that. It's not what this is about. Now, on that hall where I was at, a place called Lower Gan Eden, they took me there and they suddenly showed me a gate and they opened the gate, those two people. And I saw people learning Torah and I saw the light there and it was something really huge. Really beautiful. The light I saw in the beginning was nothing compared to that light. Nothing, nothing at all. This was something good. That was the lower Gan Eden. Just think that there was higher levels than that. When they opened Gan Eden, so he explained to us that is the lowest level, the lowest of all levels. And you saw people sitting there learning Torah. Yes. And one who teaches others? Wow, wow. I'm telling you that, a blessing. A blessing is huge. Oh, wow. Now we've just seen clips about Natan and he's talking about the Torah and how he received new revelations of Torah while he was up there. He saw people studying the Torah and what he called a lower Gan Eden, lower paradise. And he talked as well as people who teach the Torah are considered great. And, you know, this is something that you also are very um, outspoken about in your ministry. You uphold the Torah, but you uphold Torah in the prophetic manner. 
So if you can explain a little bit more in detail of what the Torah is and why you uphold it. Part of the reason that we have to understand Torah is literally it's God's character. It's pr his prophetic DNA. It's his, it's his footprint on, on humanity. When we study Torah, we study them prophetically. And most of the New Testament is the Torah, is the mitzvahs uh, revealed in their prophetic essence. So when we understand that the whole New Testament has been written by these mitzvahs, by these things that are symbolic gestures, not the physical ones, but the, 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 not the dead letter of the Torah, but the living Torah, then we begin to see what was really being said. This young man, he dies, and he ends up in heaven. And while he's there, uh, God begins to show him things, and he begins to show him that at the very lowest levels of heaven, uh, people are learning the Torah. People are learning the mitzvahs. They're learning the 613 commandments. Even the angel of death tells him, learn the mitzvahs. And in this, we have to ask ourselves, within the body of Christ, why aren't we teaching those same things? You know, one of the issues is, and one of the problems is, is because they've been thrown out of the church. But when we go back and even study early church history, we study the first few hundred years of the church, which are the early church fathers, the anti nicene fathers, we see many, many times it's told, it's mentioned that not only was the early church to follow the Torah, but it was also uh, required to understand uh, the revelation of those words, to be changed by them, to be transformed by them. Jesus said the word is alive. It's active. So if the word of God is living, then literally um, that word, when it comes into us, it creates a life in us. And this is part of the reason why a lot of the church is dead. The church has been teaching the doctrines of men. And the problem is, is there's no life in the doctrines of men. Paul warns us. He said, when uh, I came to you, I did not come with natural speech declaring to you the wisdom of God. And my uh, preaching and my teaching was not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power so that your wisdom might not be in the doctrines of men, but in the power of God. However, I speak wisdom among them that are mature yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age that are coming to nothing. I speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells us that that wisdom, the wisdom of man, and the princes of that age, the ones that were supposed to be the princes to teach Torah, those men were teaching under man's wisdom. They had diluted God's word. They had diluted God's character to their character, to their nature. So God uh, raised up a new church through Jesus, and those apostles taught not only Torah, but they taught the revelation of the deeper things um, which are being said in the Torah. And it's, it's amazing to me, when you, how can you study the New Testament and not understand what you're even talking about? You've got to go back to the original commandments to see where they came from. And then you're going to be able to realize that, that God was teaching, God was revealing his Torah in the New Testament. Now, do you also know what will happen? Yes, I know what is going to happen, yes. And you know that from there? Yes, only from there. Everything is only from there. And where are we holding right now? Where are we holding right now? In a period. Not a good one at all. At all. Like, I can tell you that the redemption is very close to here. Now, you have so much knowledge in scriptures. You've taught about redemption. Can you share about the redemption process um, based through the scriptures as well as what you've received from the Holy Spirit? The Lord started speaking to me about redemption about uh, almost two years ago. And he, he said, and not just speaking to me about redemption, he said it was coming. And that, you know, we would enter into a season at a time where the fullness of redemption would happen. Now, when you study redemption, you also come across two other events, the Battle of Gog, Magog, and God's Holy Mountain. Those three events run together. And so the Lord at that same time began to speak to me about the Battle of Gog. But in this redemptive process, literally redemption speaks of paying down a full purchase price for somebody that's been in slavery or somebody that has uh, been, been sold into slavery. When we understand that the scripture says that slavery is sin, that we're slaves to sin, that, that pretty much what Adam did in the garden, that he sold us into uh, slavery. And Jesus came, Yeshua came to redeem us from sin or redeem us from the curse. Judgment day to the Jews and the great and terrible day. Why is it the great and terrible day? Some people will be redeemed, they'll be bought back. A 
other people will be divorced. Now, sin today to us is, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever. But sin to the early church was ignorance of the truth. And literally, when we read about these early church fathers, our, our uh, fathers, not the Jewish uh, prophets, but the early church fathers, they clearly told us that sin was leaving truth or getting away from God's illumination. So now, uh, if Jesus has come to redeem us from sin, part of the redemption is that uh, truth would come to us. Now, there's a few other scriptures that talk about this redemption. One, there's a major figure that does this redemption. His name is Elijah. Jesus says in Matthew 17, for I tell you the truth, Elijah will come, future tense, and restore all things. So that's the redemption. That's the restoration brought in by these Elijah ministries, these high priestly offices. Clearly, John was not only uh, came in the spirit of Elijah, but he came as a high priest to do what? To bring the church back through the veil. And clearly, these ministries are here again. What is their, what is their function? To teach revelation to teach what the early church did in order to bring the church back into that deeper uh, a place uh, with Jesus. Well, we often talk about redemption. And most Christians think that redemption is just going to happen all on its own. But it's not. The, the scripture clearly tells us that we are going to be metamorphosed. We are going to be transformed. Amen. That's the glorified body that we're going to be metamorphosed. We are going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I don't want to be in the echo of the religious system. I, obviously, if the, the religious system hasn't changed for 2,000 years, that means God is going to send out trumpets. Prophets in the end. bring a transfiguration to our mind. Even the very last prayer of Jesus. Jesus, what should we pray? How should we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' prayer was to bring heaven to earth. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to release this realm of the glory. You know, the, the Jews would teach, and the early church taught, that when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, when he would come out, he was to bring redemption into the earth. So why does the book of Revelations, why does our great high priest, why does Jesus, who is the revelator, is the one who's revealing things to us if we're really hearing Jesus and, some not, and not some false prophets. If we're really hearing Jesus, then literally Jesus says we're high priest. And if we're high priest, we should be bring redemption like the high priesthood was into the earth to restore what Adam lost. And Israel is saying redemption has started now. Yes. Every rabbi is saying this is the Yom Kippur of redemption. They're saying we're going to be redeemed now. So we better catch up to what they already know. Can I get an amen? Matter of fact, the word vision, the rabbis taught, the priesthood taught, that when the high priest was leaving the Holy of Holies on the curtain of the veil, that they would see the vision of how Adam fell. And the very last thing, that they seen before they came out, not only was Adam's fall, but God's instruction how to restore mankind from that fall. So literally the Lord's calling us to bring the restoration of all things. That's what Jesus talked about. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, at the regeneration, uh, father, uh, those that have left father, mother, brother to come after me, amen, they're gonna receive 100-fold and eternal life. If you look at the word restoration, at the regeneration, that word is Genesis again. We're going back into the garden. We're going back into the glory for those that can see it. That is what God's called the church to. And God's now sending the trumpets, the prophets out to trumpet the message at the end of the age. You know, there's people today that believe that God doesn't have prophets anymore. I got a serious issue with that. Why? Because in the book of Revelations, the scripture, the last trumpet, says that when the seventh angel was about to sound, now the early church and the Jews taught that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he became an angel. So there is a transfiguration that happens, just like the mountain of transfiguration, when people go back into the glory. He says, when the seventh angel was about to sound, that is not an angel in heaven. That's a person that has gone back into the Holy of Holies. That's a person that's going back into the glory. 
When the seventh angel was about to sound, what was he going to sound? The seventh trumpet. What's the trumpet? Isaiah 58, the Lord tells Isaiah, lift up your voice like a trumpet. The Lord tells, uh, Jesus says uh, in the book of Revelation, John heard a voice as a trumpet speaking when Jesus spoke. Jeremiah was a trumpet. All these prophets were prophetic voices that were trumpeting the message. So now you have an individual that has become a divine being with a prophetic utterance, the trumpet. When the seventh angel is about to sound, that's a person that has gone beyond the veil. That's a person that sees what's coming and now is trying to trumpet it to who? To heaven? Do we need to trumpet these messages into heaven? No. These are messages that are being trumpeted into the earth to warn his church what's getting ready to happen. When the seventh angel was about to sound, that's a people. Sound what? The trumpet of God, the prophetic utterance. The mystery, the secret of God. What's the secrets? The secrets are things that are behind the veil. The outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies. To go into the holy of holies, you had to go beyond the veil. Beyond the veil was only for one company of people. That was for the high priestly offices. The priests didn't go get, get to go back there. The Levites didn't. Nobody got to go back there except the high priest. That's why the book of Revelation says we're high priests. Why? Because we've gone beyond the veil now. We've gone into the revelation. And once we go into that, we know the secrets of the kingdom. When the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery, the secret of people that have the prophetic message, that have gone behind the veil, that are now bringing that message out to everybody else. What's the message? The mystery of God would be finished as declared by his servants, the prophets. That angel, that trumpet now becomes a prophet telling the whole world that the secret of God is over. There's no more secrets. God has been revealed. He's been revealed like he was revealed in Adam. God, Adam was created in the image of God. God has now restored his people. The redemption has occurred. And now we look like dad again. The master of secrets Covered in darkness Open up our eyes Speaking enigmas You came down to us So Ezekiel the prophet says, On that day I will give Gog a burial place in Israel. That's exactly what they said to me, exactly. Ezekiel. Exactly the same thing. And you say that Har has a team will split? Har has a team will split in two. So Zechariah the prophet says that, yes, I the Lord shall go forth and wage war with those nations. And that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem from the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west, a great valley. And half the mountain shall move to the north and half of it to the south. How will I know when all of this has started? It will come in a boom. First of all, it is already Started. It started? According to what I saw, it has already started on the date of 27 in Elul, September 11th, 2015. In that case, it started three days before Rosh Hashanah. Gog and Magog started. This war has already started. Uh, Gog and, and Magog is just not a physical battle on the earth, but it's a spiritual battle in the heavens. Clearly, uh, there's a dethronement of demonic entities, fully dethroned, as, talks about, as talked about in the Revelations chapter 12. So when, when this young boy is caught up to heaven, and he talks about this. Literally, uh, we were in at that time, uh, Phoenix, doing a conference, and in that conference, the Lord told me that the judgment had started, and to, and, to, and to speak it out. And the confirmation that this young man gave is incredible, because the night that I spoke it out was, was Yom Kippur, which to the Jews and to uh, usually the Messianic churches, that's the great terrible day of the Lord. That's judgment day, and, and uh, that's the day that that everything begins. Even the return of the Messiah begins at, at Yom Kippur. And five days after Yom Kippur, you have the Feast of Sukkot, which is tabernacles. That was the day that this young boy was taken up on a Jewish feast, which is very relevant because when God does things, he does them on his feast all through the Bible. So for this young boy to be caught up into heaven, to get this information and download it to the, to the body of Christ and to the world in general is really saying something. The order of heaven, the order of heaven, the order of heaven, the order of heaven, speak now to me.
Five days from now, we step in Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. Tonight starts judgments. Tonight, the scapegoat was released. It's a whole teaching on the scapegoat. They put a ribbon under his neck, made out of linen, was red. Thunder and lightning are illustrative of the voice of the Lord. Matthew 24, 23 to 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even to the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. East to west describes the way into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. As the illumination lightning of the word is received, it burns up our own mindset and enables us to enter into the power of his presence. Thunders, lightning, and even earthquakes symbolically show a powerful shaking of the mindset, causing destruction. Whether that destruction is for our good or bad depends upon whether or not we spiritually see and obey the voice accompanying it. Back in 2013, uh, Pastor Mike had said, uh, what I'm hearing is, uh, we're going to see here soon, very soon, the battle of Gog and Magog happening. Uh, the reference is in uh, uh, Ezekiel 38, uh, I believe verse 21, where it talks about uh, the battle over seed, the, the, the battle of the nations rising up sword against sword. And a bro it's always been battle against brother, brother against brother from the very beginning. He's been preparing us to say, the nations are going to break out and stand against Israel and come against Israel. The Battle of Gog and Magog is really uh, the end, pretty much, of the age. When we look at this battle and, and the events that happen in it, we're also looking at the coming of the kingdom directly right after. The, the millennial kingdom is set up on the earth. And I know this probably goes against a lot of people's theology, but I'm not really interested in people's theology. I'm really just interested in what the Bible says. These rabbis literally almost, uh, it's a coming out on a daily basis, that they're saying that the battle of Gog has already started. Nathan, this young man, was also saying the same thing, that when he was taken up, that this battle had started on September the 11th. These rabbis that are talking about the battle has already been engaged, they're talking about when the Russians have gone went into Syria. Once they went into Syria, uh, they had been saying that this would be the beginning or the, uh, the escalation of that war, which then would lead into the nation of Israel. And the nations would begin to come. An important Hasidic rabbinical leader recently offered a surprising biblical interpretation of the War of Gog and Magog, the Messiah, Torah, and God's commandments. Rabbi Schallenberger, also known as the Mishkolitz Rebbe, explained that contrary to the biblical sources which describe the war of Gog and Magog as taking place in Israel, that the war has already begun and is taking place in Syria. Hi there. Uh, I wanted to update you about a very important development between um, Syria and Israel. We've been having uh, quite a few cases of Syrian mortar shells that were kind of flying uh, unintentionally or intentionally from their side to our side on the Golan Heights. And Israel uh, repeatedly responded um, to those uh, unintentional or intentional uh, falling of mortar shells on our side by either sending missiles that destroys Syrian outposts or sending our aircrafts to destroy some other things um, as a response. Last night, Israeli F-16s uh, took off from the Ramad David Air Base here at the Jezreel Valley and uh, striked uh, within the uh, deeper part of Syria as a result of a falling of a mortar shell in Israel yesterday during the daytime. Um, for the first time in probably the all five years of the Syrian um, civil war, the Syrian army and all the Syrian official media uh, channels reported that Syria responded with um, ground-to-air missiles and they uh, basically um, shut down both an Israeli drone and an Israeli fighter jet. Uh, interestingly enough, um, 
not only that it never happened, um, they did uh, send some of those ground-to-air missiles, but it, they did so after our aircraft were already in our territory about to land. And I've been saying for many, many years now that I believe that if the situation between Israel and Syria and the situation regarding Damascus is indeed the match that will eventually start the war that is described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Damascus, according to Isaiah chapter 17, will eventually cease to exist, as Isaiah suggests. So all it takes is some sort of um, loss of control or deteriorating situation between the two countries. I believe also that um, Israel will be wise not to respond harshly in, in, in a large scale unless it is going to be something that um, is of uh, great, I would say, existential threat. And the only thing that we can think of is that which is buried right underneath Damascus, which is the largest reservoir of chemical weapons um, that are still there, even from the time of Saddam Hussein smuggling his into Damascus, and of course the Assad regime, the father and the son, who kept manufacturing in their own country tons of sarin gas and uh, other means of uh, chemical uh, chemical weapons, which they are using against their own people, even throughout these uh, five years of bloody um, civil war. So this is an, an important development that uh, Syria announces for the first time in five years its military action against Israeli jets who, f who were flying above their uh, skies. And it's interesting because um, they are, for the first time, feeling confident enough to shoot rockets and to somehow respond to any activity of the Israelis um, across the border. I want to remind you all that uh, these kind of developments are very unique. I'm not going live unless it's something extremely important that, that all of us should be paying attention to. Um, all of us should be extremely excited because these are unbelievable times. Uh, Damascus, there is no doubt in my mind, will stop and cease from being a city. The Bible is very clear. Uh, the uh, reliability of the Bible and accuracy of the Bible has been tested uh, for over 3,000 years, and it is way more accurate than my own newspaper from this morning. So I trust that uh, those things will happen. We really have no control over them. As I preach more than once, there are two really tracks that um, God is working through in this world. There is a track of the international events that God, by knowing the hearts of the people and the leaders, uh, already predicted uh, things that are going to happen. And that is, of course, what the prophets, um, especially Isaiah and, and Ezekiel, have already spoken of. But then, of course, there is the path of that which God is doing in our own lives. And this has to do with our choices that we make and our walk with Him. And there, if there was any time that we needed to be very close to Him and that we needed to be um, very serious in our walk and, and be all about our Father's business, this is the time. Thank you for listening. Um, this is a live broadcast from Galilee, right next to the Armageddon Valley, right where I live. And I'm looking forward to update you uh, on future events if they are uh, that important. Berger states, whoever even tries to seek the truth about what is going on around us understands that God is bringing us towards the revelation of the kingdom of Messiah and towards redemption and the redeeming of our souls. He said, this winter there will continue to be upheavals in the world and everything will be for the good of Israel. Russia has entered into Syria with great strength and even China has announced that they will be doing so also. This will apparently lead to the Third World War with the United States and its allies and to the horrifying spilling of blood until they will all be destroyed. The rabbi called on the Jews around the world to unite and take heed of God's commandments. There remains for us 
to be united among ourselves and to be wary of internal disputes and to be careful not to speak slander about each other because the Messiah is already here and he hears everything. It is important for us to learn Torah with great enthusiasm, as it is written by the Or HaKaim in the portion of Titzvah, because Moses does not desire redemption with those who neglect Torah study. And soon we will merit seeing miracles and wonders this year when the Messiah is revealed through righteousness and loving kindness. Amen. One of the, one of the things that we see in the Battle of Gog as all the nations of the world converge on the little nation of Israel. They all converge into the Middle East. Right now, at this time, we have the Russians that are sending 150,000 troops, like I said earlier. We have the Chinese that have now committed troops. The Russians have asked them. They're going in. We have a coalition of Middle Eastern uh, forces that are going in. The United States already has special forces and they're sending more boots on the ground uh, into Syria. Again, um, it's going to be a spark. And we have the United Nations being involved in bringing a worldwide force. Now, literally, the Bible tells us, uh, now if you can imagine this, that a prophet in the Old Testament, you know, 1,500 years uh, before Jesus, saying that the whole world would come and fight in the Middle East, that the whole world would come and fight in this little nation, Back at his time, what were they going to take? How were they going to get on boats and bring armies from all over the world? Clearly, he's seen an event that could only happen in our modern modern time where all these nations would come and all these nations would gather in Israel for what event? For this battle of, of Gog that the Bible speaks about. In this battle, it is the precursor. It is uh, the very thing that happens before the Lord begins just to shut down everything and he brings his kingdom into the earth. Now, this young man literally has told us that when he was in heaven, that he heard that this event had already started, that there was no way of getting out of it, no repentance, that the only thing that, could, that we could do is, is get our hearts right with God for the things that were coming to make it easier on ourselves. And really, he's talking about being righteous before the Lord. But he says, as the months come, that this battle would get closer and closer and closer until finally the fullness of that battle would be that uh, uh, Gog would be destroyed and uh, buried in the, in, the, in the city of Jerusalem. He talks about literally some horrible things that will happen there, nations, uh, people, uh, I believe he said over a million people in one day will be killed, that the war will only last, I think it is uh, two weeks that literally uh, uh, Israel would be left defenseless. Now, what's interesting to me that this should be something that the church should be echoing. This is something that the church should be saying, you, we need to get ready. This is something that uh, pastors and prophetic voices in our country should be telling their people that it's time uh, for, the, for, for the end time events to come into their fullness and, and they should be preparing their hearts. But part of that preparation, one, according to the rabbis, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, is mitzvahs, is the commandments of God. The early church believed that. The early church taught it. And the revelation of the word of God. And these are things that are just almost absent within the body, within the church today. We're calling things uh, 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 in the Bible, we're calling them biblical, and we're defining biblical terms in the, in the complete wrong way than the way that they were given to us. One, by the early church fathers and and two, even coming out of the Old Testament into the New, we've lost the definitions. And, uh, you know, but Jesus told us it would be that way. So when we look at this unfolding of this battle of God, really it's a picture that, one, things are going to begin to get very serious. When Nathan gave that prophecy, literally nobody was thinking about the Middle East. Are there any other prophetic signs, prophecies that are pointing to now in this unique time in history? The, the prophecies... Um, when we look at prophecies coming to the church, uh, there's many prophecies. A rabbi by the name of uh, Judah ben Samuels, he prophesied what was called the 50 or uh, the 10 Jubilee prophecy. In that prophecy, he begins to uh, put a timeline on, and that timeline begins to count down literally to the year 
2016. The final prophecy, the final word that he gives is literally that there would be the return of Messiah in, uh, within that time frame. Many rabbis are saying just because of biblical events, it has to happen before 2018. But this is one very accurate prophetic word because uh, in his prophecy uh, that was given to him, he named specific events, literally uh, that Israel would get back their nation in uh, the, uh, the Six-Day War, that uh, many things, Jerusalem would be given back to them in that time, which we know it was in 1967. So when we take a look at his prophecy, in it there, there's four major events that happen that prove that what he was saying prior to this was, was true and that it was happening. So why wouldn't the last part of his prophecy come to pass? Very interesting, very powerful prophecy uh, that tells us that we're in a time frame and a season that God is, is saying the door is getting ready to shut. Again, he's trying to wake up the church. It was in the year of 1217 of the Common Era that one of Judah's most legendary and prolific German Hasidic rabbis, Judah ben Samuel, made an astounding prediction about the future of Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah. Rabbi Judah ben Samuel said, When the Ottomans, the Turks, conquer Jerusalem, they will rule over Jerusalem for eight jubilees. Afterwards, Jerusalem will become a no-man's land for one jubilee, and then in the ninth jubilee, it will once again come back into the possession of the Jewish nation, which would signify the beginning of the Messianic end time. Instead of annihilation, Israel won one of the most decisive victories in military history. Many Orthodox Jews and Christians believe the Jewish nation had witnessed a miracle. As Judah ben Samuel predicted, the Ottoman Turks took control of Jerusalem until its fading years, when the Allied forces swept the last ruler of the Ottomans from power by the forces of the British military troops under the command of General George Allenby in 1917. If this sabbatical messianic cycle, 2009 to 2017, is completed, and the Gog and Magog War does begin within the year between Rosh Hashanah 2015 to Rosh Hashanah 2016, then the Messianic era will commence before Rosh Hashanah 2017. Another Jewish rabbi by the name of uh, Vilna Gion, uh, he lived in the 1700s. This rabbi, uh, the Lord began to speak to him. He was also a, a, he was a prophetic type of rabbi. Uh, uh, both of these men were, were in that area of the mystics. They, they seen mysteries, they'd seen the secrets, they'd seen deeper things. But Vilna Gion prophesied two major events, and this prophecy has only come to light just in the last two years. First off, uh, the Lord showed him when the Russians would enter into Krema and take that, that, that area, that nation, that that was a sign that the coming of the Messiah was at the door. He said the second event that would happen is that the Russians would go into Istanbul, the capital of Turkey. Now, nobody you know, in their right mind would have ever thought that the, the Russians would ever be provoked to go into Turkey. But recently, just within the last month, the, the Turkish nation, the Turkish army shot down a Russian jet and provoking Russia because it was flying over their airspace to bomb targets in Syria that uh, the uh, world doesn't understand why Turkey would do this. But literally now we, we understand why. The president of Turkey is making some incredible claims of one being the caliphate, one uh, the leader of the, the uh, uh, Islamic nations. And there is even speculation or things that have been said that uh, he is claiming to be the head of ISIS. Now, I just read documentation today where he just was in uh, Saudi Arabia this week and he went in to one of the most holy shrines that basically nobody's allowed to go into except the return of the prophet or the, their messiah or their caliphate. So why would this president, why would this man be in that shrine unless he's marking himself to be the end time world leader? When you understand the Muslim caliphate, 
This man is an individual that will start a third world war that will literally bring destruction into the earth in order to usher in the coming of their Messiah. This man is clearly making statements and clearly doing things that he is proclaiming to be this individual. 200 years ago, a war between Turkey and Russia was prophesied as a sign of redemption, a secret closely guarded for hundreds of years concerning the messianic process. Rabbi Moshe Stromberg, a respected rabbi in the Orthodox Jewish community, shared the full prophecy publicly for the first time in March of 2014. He is the great-grandson of Rabbi Elijah ben Shlomo Zalman, also known as Vilna Gion, a Jewish scholar from the 18th century who is well known for his contributions in understanding the Messianic process, one of the most influential Jewish leaders in modern history. Just before his death in 1797, Vilna Goyon left his followers with a prophetic statement about two specific events that would happen just before the appearance of the Messiah. The first event, when you hear that the Russians have captured Crimea, you should know that the times of the Messiah have started, that his steps are being heard. And secondly, when you hear that the Russians have reached the city of Constantinople, today's Istanbul, you should put on your Shabbat clothes and don't take them off, because it means that the Messiah is about to come at any minute. In March 2014, the first part of Vilna Gion's messianic message came true when Russia annexed the internationally recognized Ukrainian territory of Crimea. The second part of the secret regarding Istanbul may come to fruition through the Iran nuclear deal. В этот священный день уверен, что и 2014 год войдет в его летопись, как год, когда живущие здесь народы твердо определили быть вместе с Россией. I think one of the, the, the most profound uh, words that are in Scripture, if we want to get to the Scripture, is the book of Daniel. Daniel prophesies and he tells us that the seventh week, the week of uh, uh, the rebuilding when Jerusalem is reestablished, that there would be seven weeks uh, until the coming of the Messiah. Well, we know that Jerusalem was given back to the Jews in 1967. And actually, we know the date. It was uh, uh, the month of June, June 7th, 1967. And the 70th week of Daniel, I've seen rabbis talk about this. Uh, it's seven weeks of seven or 49 uh, years. If we take that time... And we multiply it by the Hebrew calendar or the Hebrew year, which is 360 days, 49 times 360 days. It comes down to 17,640 days. So if we count from June 7th, 1967, 17,640 days, it falls on September, uh, the September day of the Feast of Yom Kippur, which is Judgment Day. When we understand Judgment Day, the rabbis, the Jews and the early church all believed that Jesus or that the end time events would begin on that day. And the prophecies of Daniel starting in June 7th, 1967, when Israel would get back to Jerusalem, that would begin the restoration of all things. And a countdown started at that time. That countdown was to tell us that from June 7th, hallelujah, until the end of the age or until the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amen. We know that, that Daniel's 70th week, or seven weeks of seven, seven times seven is 49. The Hebrew calendar is 360 days. 360 plus 40 times 49 is 17,640 days. So the rabbis count from June 7th, and it's following September 23rd, 2015. Yeah. September 23rd, 2015 is Yom Kippur. Amen. It's coming here. So I know that we are stepping into a time of transition. Hallelujah. So here we are with all these events. The world is moving into what we would call World War III, but what we don't understand that there's already a battle going on in the heavens. And that battle in the heavens is for the redemption of all things. And, and the church is asleep. The church is not preparing. The church is lethargic. There's no trumpets. There's nobody crying out to wake up. People aren't serious about even their loved ones, their relatives, 
to get saved, to give their heart to Jesus. Nobody is questioning anything. It's just going on as usual and the way it always has. There's a spirit of death on the church. Literally, when, when you understand the parable, when Jesus talked about the 10 virgins, he said they were all asleep. But to be asleep in scripture also means to be dead. Jesus could have used that word there. They were dead. And literally, he's calling for the church to wake up. Then the same shall be given into his hands for a time and time and a half a time. Literally, I believe that time and time and a half a time is, is, is a thousand year increments. Daniel lived 500 years before Christ. I believe the time, the time, and the half a time is a thousand, a thousand, and five hundred. Meaning, if Daniel lived 500 years before Christ, 500 years from, from, from uh, Daniel to Jesus, and a time and a time, 1,000, 2,000 years. We're in the time frame. Everything actually points to that. Everything points to right now. This is the time for the saints to possess the kingdom. We just came out of a series of blood red moons, the tetrads. The whole world, you know, was talking about it. They made a movie on it. And everybody thought the end of the world was coming in September. The prophecy of Joel, when he talks about the quatred blood red moons, the, the sackcloth and the blood red moons, he's talking about a marking of end time events. He's talking about how that the end of a Shemitah year, going into a Jubilee year, that it would mark the, the beginning of end time events. Now, when you begin to understand this prophecy and you begin to understand what Joel is really talking about, he's already talking, God's already telling us uh, what, what would be happening as signs in the heavens that his return is imminent. One, there would be the quatrit blood red moons, which we know only has happened seven times in history, uh, usually on major catastrophes. And that's why a lot of people thought about catastrophes that would come. Second was uh, Joel talks about is the sackcloth moon. So the blood red and sackcloth moon coming together. Literally, that only happened at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. So this is only the second time in the last 2,000 years that this event has really happened. And so now when we put it into biblical time frames, we can understand the season that we're walking in. Now, you've heard me say this many times, and for the new people, I'm just going to share this. The, the great and terrible day of the Lord, according to the rabbis, has to be marked by several events. One of the events is in the book of Joel. It's the sackcloth and blood red moons, or the quadrant blood red moons. We know that that's only happened seven times in the last 2,000 years, where we've had four quadrant blood red moons falling on Hebrew holidays. Amen? Amen. The last sackcloth moon was back at the crucifixion of Messiah in 32-33 AD. So 32-33 AD at the crucifixion, there was four blood red moons and one sackcloth. So that marked the prophecy of Joel, which talks about the blood red and sackcloth moons. Now we've had, uh, since then, we have had five quadrant blood red moons. One fell on 1947, 48, or 48, 49, when Israel became a nation again after the Second World War. Happens again, 1967, all falling on Hebrew holidays, which are really our holidays. Hallelujah. Amen. Falling on uh, uh, June 7th, 1967, which was. The Seven Day War, Israel gets back to Jerusalem on Yom Kippur, hallelujah. And now we are stepping into another quadrant with a sackcloth. This is the first one in 2,000 years since the time of Messiah till now. So what does that tell us? That's the sign of Joel coming to pass. Then the prophecy of Daniel has to come to pass. And I have already explained that to you. Amen. So it has to happen in a jubilee year. There are signs that are telling us that we are in a prophetic season and the Lord is trying to awaken the church through, hallelujah, divine utterance. And I know there's a lot of my brothers out there that don't believe in signs and wonders anymore, but uh, one of the greatest fundamentalists, his name was Schofield. And when Schofield defined signs and wonders, he defined them as those things that reveal disbelief in the hearts of the people, meaning the sign is there to find out and to separate who really is believers in the scripture and who is not believers. Because if we believe, Jesus said, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers. Our action has to line up with the transformation of our life to prepare ourselves.
for what he wants to do. So when we look at these prophecies and we look at these things that the, that the scripture tells us, we're clearly in a time of transition and change. But the issue is, will we be part of that kingdom? Will we be part of that realm of glory? Or we will, just, will we just stay asleep? This Yom Kippur, if you see what's being said on the televisions and by the prophets all over the world, same stuff is being said. Amen. There is, this is the transition. There is not another one coming. This is the one. When you look, when you look at biblical prophecy, the blood red moons, the quadrants, the sackcloth moons of Joel, when you look at the prophecies of Ezekiel, it all points to right now. The rabbis are saying it cannot even go another year. So I don't know where you're at with Jesus, but you better get serious. But everything has come to the end of time. Everything is in the place. And position according to God's Torah. We're going to see the glory of God in 2017. We will see the glory. The religious system will not see the glory of God. But God is going to reveal his glory for this end time move to prepare the new high priesthood that is talked about in the book of Revelation to bring in the final harvest. According to the early church, they talked about the net. When Jesus talked at the end of the age, the net would be cast, preached on it uh, Monday down in Duarte. He said that net is divine knowledge. It's the secrets of the kingdom. This next revival is just not going to be about miracle signs and wonders. It's going to be about divine revelation, the mysteries of the kingdom, things that are being released right now, being released to bring life into the church again, to bring the fire, the baptism, outer court. Praise and labor, baptism of water, holy place, the menorah, the church filled with the anointing oil, Revelations 120, baptism of the spirit, holy of holies, baptism of fire, because our God is an all-consuming fire. Genesis 3.24, Moses said that the cherubim that were put outside the garden with flaming swords, that word flame means secrets and mysteries. In case you didn't realize it, the baptism of fire was already released in this room today. It's here. It is here. This next move is being released. God is getting ready to reveal his glory in the earth again, unlike any other glory that has been seen. This is his time. And this is the time of his son. Hallelujah. He's not coming back as Mashiach ben Joseph, the Messiah of Joseph. He's coming back as Mashiach ben David, the conquering king. He's coming to conquer saints. And the first thing he wants to conquer is your mindset. And hallelujah. It's time we get away with all those other lovers all those other things because the Lord has a bigger plan for you. Can I get an amen? Hey! Hallelujah. Breaking Israel news. The Perez's death signal, end of Yosefic Messiah and beginning of Davidic Messiah. October 5th, 2016. I sense that the period of Moshiach ben Yosef ended with the burial of Shimon Perez the last of the founding fathers of the state that embodied that process of creating the state, Rabbi Apistorp said. This is an unmistakable historic shift. And, remarkably, it was as if the whole world acknowledged this by running to Jerusalem to be present for that messianic shift. If this is true, then beginning this past Shabbat, and then as the new year began, the transition period ended, and we are now solely in the period of Moshiach ben David, explained Rabbi Apistorp. You know, the reason that we put this video together is because we see and we've been preaching about the sleeping church. Bottom line is, events are happening all over the world and people are still getting into our pulpits every week and they're still talking about natural things. They're start, still talking about men's theologies or basically how they can get money out of your pocket. There has been a massive shift in the of the world. There's been a huge 
sign and wonder these happen in our time frame. The events that we are looking at right now are events that point to the second coming of our Lord and Savior. I hear the voice of the Lord crying, wake up, I'm coming. I hear Jesus telling his church, wake up, sleeping virgin, wake up. We in the body of Christ today need to wake up to see what's really happening. The Lord is drawing his remnant in through the veil. And Jesus did not tell us everybody would make it. He's told us a remnant would make it. Many shall come in my name and say, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy, cast out demons, do miracle signs and wonders. He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, twisted teachings. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to twisted teaching within the church. The early church fathers warned us about this time. Jesus told us about the great falling away. You can't fall away until you're saved. Jesus warns us in the book of Revelations. He says, come out of her, my people. He's talking about the harlot systems. He's talking about the Babylonian systems that are not in the world. The word Babylon means a mixture in speech or a mixture in the anointing. God is pulling and releasing his church from the mixture. And the issue is, are we coming out? God is trumpeting a message, saints, and the trumpets are sounding. And the issue is, do you want to wake up? Do you want to be ready for what he's getting ready to do? Or do you want to stay asleep and miss the greatest events that the Bible talks about? You and I are part of that season and that time. And it's our job to echo that message into the nations. It's time that we get out from in front of our televisions and we go out and start bringing in the souls, the souls that Jesus wants, the souls that Jesus is thirsty for. God's calling us to bring in the nations of the world.